welcome to St. Luke's Friends. It's good to gather in the name of Jesus, in the name of our great God, Father, Son, and Spirit, the only worthy and incomparable one, the only incomparable one, the one who stands alone in power and all perfections. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We have opportunity to remember the wonderful kindness and grace of our one God revealed as Trinity in the Gloria. And so we say this together now. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Well, by a, a God incidence, our collect for this week ties in beautifully with our scripture reading. And so we take a moment now to say together the prayer for the week. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated and we'll have our Old Testament and then our Psalm. The first reading is from Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. Love the Lord your God. These are the commands, decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children and their children, after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Hear the word of the Lord. And the psalm is Psalm 78, verses 1 to 8. And 
after the colon, if you could join in, please. Give heed to me, my teaching, O my people. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth, for I will open my mouth in a parable and the mysteries of foreign times. What we have heard and known, what our forebears have told us. We will not hide from their children, but declare to a generation yet to come the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, his mighty and wonderful works. He established a law in Jacob and made a decree in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children, that future generations might know, and those yet unborn, that they might turn my teaching to the children, so that they might put their confidence in God and not forget his works, but keep his commandments and not be as their forebears, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not get their hearts aright, whose spirit was not thankful. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. quite get used to wearing these face masks do you? I'm sure you don't either they still feel quite awkward don't they uh, but we're wearing them for a good cause uh, we've just reflected on God's faithfulness down the generations and we're going to sing about that now with our first hymn so can I invite you to be upstanding great is thy faithfulness
The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, our great God, Father, Son, and Spirit, you are the one at the centre of all reality. Our whole being, our present, our future depends on you. You are the great incomparable one. We worship you today in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. One day, near the end of his ministry, Jesus was approached by a uh, religious leader inquiring as to the heart of the law. Of all the hundreds of laws in the Torah, which is the highest? You know the story. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Mark tells the account, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And philosophers, religious gurus, much of humankind has been asking this same question in one way or another for thousands of years. What does it mean to really follow God, obey God? The atheist says, well, there is no spirit being beyond what we can see and touch. The material world is ultimate All who claim to know God then are misled. Many regular Australians, while not convinced by atheism, may in fact live practically as if there is no God. The great philosopher Charles Taylor calls this the pursuit of human flourishing. Our happiness here, our human flourishing here, is ultimate, is all that matters. We don't have anything to do with the God who is beyond us. Well, Jesus, of course, loves people, but rejects the idea that God is a fiction. For him, God is very real. And Jesus rejects the idea, challenging many Australians, that our human happiness here is the most important pursuit of all. A careful reading of the scriptures shows us that happiness is a byproduct of something else. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Ask the teacher of the law the most important one. Answer Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Of course, Jesus is using Deuteronomy chapter 6, part of the scriptures known as the Shema. The Shema, that's the first word of the text in the Hebrew. The text of Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel... Shema, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Here, in the original language that's behind our English, it's not just perceive the commands of God with the ear, but hear, listen, listen, obey God's Commands. That's the sense of the Hebrew, Shema. 
And the most important command to hear and obey, the command to be devoted to the incomparable, the only creator and ruler of the cosmos, the only God with all power and authority, the only inescapable God because he's everywhere present, so I can't escape him no matter where I am in his world. The God revealed to Israel under the divine name, the Lord, Yahweh, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. We might think of the various ways this God, the God of Israel demonstrated supremacy in the scriptures. Above all, he is supreme over other so-called gods and powers. In Deuteronomy 6, the people are on the verge of the promised land. That's the story. About to enter and inherit this wonderful gift. Just a few decades before, the Lord had delivered the nation, showing to all his supremacy over the superpowers of the time, his supremacy over Egypt in all her political and military might. The Lord showed his supremacy even over the gods of Egypt, gods that could not save Egypt from plague, death, or humiliating military defeat. The Lord even revealed his supremacy over the forces of nature in that story, didn't he? Dividing the Red Sea so Israel could pass through the God of Israel, the God of Israel, therefore, is God, incomparable, incomparable. There's no other like him, incomparable in power. And Israel also has seen, too, that their God stands alone in his moral perfections. He is incomparable in compassion and goodness, in devoted love and in holiness. Christian leader and thinker John Frame puts it best when he says, only one being can be fully in control of all other beings so that no one can deliver out of his hand. Only one being can be the standard of perfection, goodness, love, knowledge, truth. And this is how the Lord is described Deuteronomy 32, see that I myself am he, there is no God beside me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal and no one can deliver out of my hand. The prophet Isaiah describes the Lord's supremacy in salvation when he says in Isaiah 45, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. We, the church today, worship this God, this one God, but now revealed to us as Trinity in our New Testament scripture. The veil, the veil that covered the mysterious three in one has been parted. We have seen that three distinct persons share this incomparable divine being, share this supremacy of power and moral perfection, three distinct persons. As the Athanasian Creed puts it, the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. There is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. This is our tradition as a church, friends, the Athanasian Creed. There is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. And so they share supremacy, the three distinct persons. In the little bit of time we have now, I want you to notice how we are commanded to respond, to relate to this one incomparable God. How? Love him. Love him with all that we are. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, 
the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Some read the laws of the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, the stipulations and decrees, and see in them rules and rules and rules, laws that stifle and control people. That's how some people respond to the body of of law in the Old Testament, in the Torah. But understood rightly, the body of instruction given Israel was simply a way of life, a vision of life so expansive that it touched every dimension. A vision of life driven, though, by one great passion, the love of God. All behavior, all outer obedience was meant to flow from the Israelites' heartfelt love for the Lord. And here we see, don't we, the similarity between what God asked of Old Testament Israel and what he asked of the church today in the new covenant. We, the church, living in the new relationship with God that Jesus has made possible by his blood, are also called to love God and called to love him in the concrete particularities of our lives. Jesus, too, speaks of everyday life, doesn't he? Consider the Sermon on the Mount. He speaks a lot of everyday life as the place where we show our love for God. We and the Israelites are called to put the one great pursuit at the center of our entire lives, the love of this one God, this God who is incomparable, who stands alone, who is one in power and moral perfection. We're called to love God with all the heart, that is, to make him our deepest desire, to love him with the soul, that is, to seek fellowship with him above else, in prayer, in thanksgiving, in communion with him, in solitude, seeking those times of intimacy with him, to love him with our souls, to love him with our strength with every capacity of these bodies of ours, the love of God. Well, the good news is that our risen Lord gives us the power to actually do this. We have the command, just like the people of Israel, love this one God now revealed to us in Trinity, and we have the power to do it because our risen Lord has renewed our hearts by his love, gifted us with the Holy Spirit, moved us by the good news of the gospel to have a responsive love for God. As the great framer of our prayer book tradition, Thomas Cranmer put it, let me read a quote from Thomas Cranmer, the original architect of the prayer book, if the profession of our faith of the remission of our sins enter within us in the deepness of our hearts, then it must kindle a warm fire of love in our hearts toward God. If we know that we're forgiven, he's saying, then that knowledge must kindle a wonderful love for God in our hearts. And our Lord has also given us a promise that one day at the end of the human story, as we know it, when Christ returns, we will, of course, be caught up in an ever-deepening love, love of God. On that day when we are raised to resurrection life, we will plunge into the love of God and it'll be, it'll be like a a wonderfully deep pool of water that just keeps going down and down and down and we just keep swimming down and down and down. The love of God, we just keep going deeper and deeper into it in that day of resurrection. Now, as we wait for this great embrace, this great love, we purify our hearts. 
How do we purify our hearts? Well, I'm going to suggest, as we come now near the end of our time and our reflection, three lines of application. What are the three applications? What does it mean to really love God above everything else? Well, here are three applications. Number one, if I really love God first, I will put human happiness in third place. It's a consideration. It's a factor, my personal sense of happiness. But after love of God and service of neighbour. That's the first application. Second application. We will avoid, if we really love God, we will avoid participation in alternate religions, sects and fellowships. Because we love our great God, Father, Son and Spirit above all else, we will turn away from other spirit beings, spirit guides, turn away from seeking knowledge of the future through horoscopes, witchcraft or consulting the dead. Now, you might think I'm being alarmist, but that does go on in some quarters. But if we love God, we'll have nothing to do with it. We will turn away from seeking power, influence, life, success through practices of new age spirituality. Turn away from participate, participating in any sect or religion that makes the Father, the Son and the Spirit, this one incomparable God revealed to us as Trinity, will turn away from participating in any religion that makes him less than supreme. Of course, we can be friends with people from other faiths, but we don't participate in their practices because we love this God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And the final line of application I want to suggest is this. We, the whole faith community, will put passing on faith to emerging generations at the centre of our lives. If there is one God, Father, Son and Spirit, if he is truly incomparable and our only saviour, if he is supreme in power and full of moral perfections, then emerging generations have no other source of life. There's no other option. They don't have any other option. No other source of hope, satisfying purpose. Therefore, the faith community and the family is called to demonstrate the reality of this one God to emerging generations. Creatively painting a picture with our children, with our church's children, of a life that is shaped by the only incomparable God. That's what the scripture underlines and emphasizes. Deuteronomy 6.6 6, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Now, let me say something important here. God is not describing in this scripture, Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 7, he's not describing mindless repetition and rote learning of law and verse. That's not what this is about. If you understand the text sensitively, that's not what's being commended. What's being described is a creative exploration of a God-shaped life. When do we explore the meaning of this God-shaped life? In the living room, in the car on the way to school, in the church foyer, when we encounter a young person, any time we can, when the child shares something from school 
about what they're learning, global warming, plastic pollution in the ocean. Well, how does the scripture describe creation care? Let's explore creatively a God-shaped life with this child who's asked the question. When we discuss getting a COVID vaccine, how does the gospel story impact our fears and worries about that vaccine? I mean, they hear us talking about the vaccine. Why don't we bring God into that dialogue? Great Old Testament thinker Walter Brueggemann speaks of this. This is his phrase, endless and imaginative reiteration. The older generation endlessly and imaginatively imaginatively reiterates, repeats something vital, explores this God-shaped life with coming generations so that our conversation no longer centres on our worries, our fears or our desires to acquire but our conversation centres on God. The subject matter is shifted from us and all our getting and spending, all our fears and hopes, says Brueggemann, to place at the centre of this family the one known as liberator and commander. That's what Deuteronomy is speaking of. It's far different to mindless rote learning. And in Deuteronomy 6, if we read the text carefully, and just my final thought for this morning, we're given another interesting component to this task of passing on faith to children in our church life, in our family life, and that is the component of personal witness. Personal witness. We're told to witness The older generation is to witness to the younger, to offer their testimony of the power and the miracles and the goodness of God. It's described there in Deuteronomy 6. In the future, when your son or your daughter asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell them, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. There's the testimony. We were slaves, but God freed us. And that's why our family centers its life on this God. We were slaves, but our Lord Jesus freed us through his death and resurrection. And that's why our church has this God at the center of its life. And so our text today describes an engaging, multifaceted passing on of the story of God to emerging generations. And that's the third application for this morning. Well, we've come to the end of our time. Let me pray. Our great God, Father, Son, and Spirit, you are incomparable in power, in moral perfection. You have all goodness and holiness. And you revealed to us in the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Help us to love you even more more than we pursue our personal sense of happiness. We know that our happiness will come as a byproduct of loving you. Help us to pass on the faith to emerging generations as a church and as members of families. Help us to turn away from participating in any fellowship or sect that doesn't put you at the centre. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you now to be upstanding as we say together the creed. Let us together affirm the faith of the church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, 
begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. You may be seated. now pray for the world and for the church. Let us pray for the preservation of the earth. Our Father, we give thanks for the beauty and abundance of the earth. Give us and all peoples grace to live in harmony with your creation. Give us wisdom and generosity in our use of its bounty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for peace and shared prosperity. We give thanks for leaders who serve the common good. Give wisdom to those who have responsibility and authority in every land, that we may share with justice the resources of the world and work together in trust. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for Australia. We give you thanks, Father, for this land and the diversity of its peoples. Grant that we may so honour one another, that all may be enriched by our common heritage and freed from despair, poverty and exclusion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the church and its mission. We give thanks for the good news of salvation for all people. Strengthen us for our work in the world. Empower your church to proclaim the gospel in service, word, and sacrament. And Lord, we especially pray for Nungalinya College, training Indigenous leaders in the Northern Territory. We give you thanks for staff and students and the learning and sharing that occurred in semester one. We thank you for the spirit of real reconciliation in Northern Territory communities and churches. And Father, we ask for wisdom for the NT government concerning COVID lockdowns and vaccinations. And we ask and we pray for volunteer groups who are disappointed that their trips to Nangalinya have been cancelled. I pray that you would encourage them and spur them on in their support of the college. Unite in the truth all who confess your name, that we may live together in love to your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks that you are the God who brings mercy and wholeness. Comfort and heal, we pray, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other trouble. Give to those who care for them wisdom, patience and gentleness, and to us all, your peace. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The prayer of approach. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. We've reflected today on how our God is incomparable in his moral perfections, his love, his kindness. And so resting in his love, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be upstanding. And we have opportunity to pass a uh, COVID-safe peace to one another, and, and then we will continue with our next hymn before the throne. We are the body of Christ. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Take a moment to pass that peace. And we continue now with our worship before the throne of God above. I have a strong, a perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. Let's worship.
I invite my assistants to come forward. Wonderful. Well, in, in anticipation of our offerings, which um, you may bring forward as you come for communion, uh, let us bless God for his provision for us. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All glory and honour be yours always and everywhere, mighty creator, ever-living God. We give you thanks and praise for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name for ever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine, and we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and his blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And we declare together, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, we do as our Saviour has commanded proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, proclaiming his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. So come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us. Let's feed on him in our hearts by faith, with thanksgiving.
us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that in this sacrament you assure us of your goodness and love. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and help us to grow in love and obedience that we may serve you in the world and finally be brought to that table where all your saints feast with you forever. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. It's a moment or two for community news and uh, I'll begin with the birthdays. Barbara Johnson and Amy Bakara this week. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Have also uh, some good news from Mel Young, who's a member of Parish Council and who also shared her testimony here about a month ago. So on Friday, Mel and Nathan welcomed into the world Stephen Lee, born safely and mum's doing okay as well. That just happened on Friday. She wanted to let you all know. So I just wanted to pass that on. So we thank God for his goodness. There's bits and pieces in your news sheet. Mother's Union this Wednesday. So we look forward to that and information about that there. Um, I wanted to share with you about the Discipleship Explored course and uh, you might find an insert in your news sheet about that. There's morning and evening sessions beginning on July 26, eight Mondays. Sign-up sheets are in the foyer today, so we'd love you to sign up if you're interested. You can choose either morning or evening. Uh, and there's a video about that now. Thank you. great course to bring a friend along to as well as you can see very well put together the videos are, are just top quality just like anything you'd see on TV we're going to be taken to Philippi so we'll get a sense of the place Paul was writing to and we're going to hear stories of Christians loving God serving Jesus today from all over the globe we're going to look at some of the themes in Paul's letter to Philippians so wonderful resource let me encourage you to consider attending and register Renee, you've got one or two notices. So there's a notice here from my wife, Louisa, uh, about the winter family fun night. So if you've got primary school age kids or perhaps slightly lower to bring along, uh, please consider that this Friday, $5 per family. And this week, Coffee on Karela are serving Indigenous coffee. So come along and try out. It's an indigenous coffee. That sounds very interesting. You've, you've intrigued all of us. That, there's going to be a, a rush at the door. Indigenous coffee. All right. Well, I'll let you read the other bits and pieces uh, in the new sheet in your own time. 
And uh, at this point, I'll invite you to be upstanding. I'll invite our cross bearer to come forward. We'd love to leave you with a blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.